Amen. That's the remnant. How many are glad you're a part of the remnant? Amen, amen, amen. Awesome. Okay, so I have a lot of notes today, so you got to stick with me. Everybody ready? Buckle your seatbelts. As Pastor says, I'm going to preach a lot of information in a short amount of time, so you better be listening carefully. Amen? All right, so also we have notes on the YouVersion Bible app, so you can pull those up, follow along with me. We have notes on the back table. You can also buy a fancy schmancy notebook um, <laughs> that says Family First Ambassador Training Manual on it in the back. You can keep all of your notes together. Thank you, Miss Mandy. And um, just, you know, open that binder, put your handout in every week, and then you have all your sermon notes together, which is really nice, especially during a series that you can keep it all handy. So today is my turn to talk about the remnant, and I'm excited. I was thinking about this and praying about this, and I just felt like there were so many things that I could say about the remnant, because God's just been stirring our hearts on this theme for quite a while now. And I actually felt like the Lord had me to talk about what remnant isn't. So today we're going to talk about what it is versus what it isn't. And there's, there's a lot that people might think they're remnant or is remnant, which actually isn't remnant. So we have to really carefully judge through the lens of scripture. The, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. You know, not everyone who claims to be remnant is remnant. Not everyone who says they're a Christian is the real deal. Am I right? So do me a favor. Talk back at me today. If I say um, something that you really agree with, shout me down. Say amen, hallelujah, preach a sister. You know, I want to hear y'all, not just me preaching to you. Amen? amen. <laughs> Okay, so let me put this little teaser out here before we get started. What do you think that soda, cake, and a blanket have to do with the remnant? So just dwell on that for a little bit. Um, on this opening slide that we saw in the video, it says remnant, that which remains. Now I was thinking upon that, that which remains. So if you think about remaining, that's what's left behind, right? That's the remnant. So it brought me to think about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So I want to start here in verse 13. And actually, Paul says two times about those who are left, those who are remaining. But you do, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the, crowd, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so that we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, this is a powerful scripture because, first of all, it promises the Lord's second coming. But also, it promises that though we are apart right now, it says, those who are alive who are left. So though we're separated in the natural from Jesus right now, Jesus is in heaven and we're here on earth. So though we're separated right now in the physical, that's only for a little while. Amen? Because it says, be encouraged with these words. We will be with the Lord together once we're caught up with him in the air. So this separation is temporary. So that which remains, we are the body of Christ here on earth while the head, which is Christ, is in heaven. So this separation is temporary, but we are his hands and feet in the meantime, on earth, doing his kingdom work, doing what he's called us to do, the assignment that he has given us to be his remnant church, it's for now. It's for those who are alive, who are left, those he has commissioned and he has left behind. He says, I trust you to go into all the world, to preach the gospel, to make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I have entrusted this to you, and we are God's only plan. Amen. You know, there's no plan B. You know, if that doesn't work out, if we don't follow the instructions... There's nothing else. We are the hope for this world. We are the hope 
for culture because I'm telling you, it's looking bad. Culture does not have any hope whatsoever except for the hope that we can bring them as the remnant church through the word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, as I said, not all who consider themselves Christians are remnant. And that can be kind of a, a sobering word. I don't want to be gloom and doom today. But, you know, maybe that's my, it's my turn now. As pastor was a couple weeks ago, he said, I'm John the Baptist coming out of the wilderness today. So maybe that's, that's me today. But that's okay because, you know what, I'd rather speak the truth and speak it strong and speak it right from the word of God than water it down. Amen. Amen. That's right. I'm in the right house, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so number one, what is remnant? Remnant isn't proportional. Now, that kind of sounds like interesting. Remnant isn't proportional. Stay with me. Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others, sent them on ahead, ahead of them two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Now, this is very intriguing because you can see here Jesus is sending out his disciples. He's sending out the 72, right? And he's sending them to go preach the gospel, you know, to save and deliver, and he's sending them out. But what's interesting is that he tells them, don't take anything with you. <laughs> and it got me thinking, you know, Every time I've gone on a missions trip, every time I've gone to a youth camp, anytime you go anywhere to do ministry, they, they give you a packing list, right? And they said, make sure you have everything that you need. Make sure you pack your sleeping bag. Make sure you pack your pillow. Make sure you pack shower shoes. Make sure you pack, um, when we went on missions trip to Africa, make sure you bring extra peanut butter and jelly and Gatorade powder, all these things you will need, right? And they, we say, okay, be prepared be wise but what does Jesus say <laughs> it says take nothing with you <laughs> so what I mean by remnant isn't proportional is that it won't make sense to our natural minds it will seem illogical it will seem like why would we do that why would we go out with, with nothing why would we almost seem unprepared but see first Jesus wants us to see that it's not a level playing field because the remnant is not called to compete with what the world has to offer. The proportion of our assignment is not equal to the proportion of what's with us on the surface. You know, what you see with your natural mind, what you see with your physical eyes, it won't make sense. And we know that from the feeding of the 5,000. How in the world could five loaves and two fish feed 5,000 men plus women and children? It does not make sense. It literally does not make sense. So what we have to do as the remnant is stop trying to figure it out <laughs> because it will never make sense. It will never be rational. It will never be reasonable. It will never be logical. But you know what? That's what God does. He takes things that are unexplainable and he does them miraculously. Am I right? That's what God does through scripture time and time again when he performs a miracle. That way he gets the glory. We can't do it without him. You know, in verse 3, he actually says, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. Right there, it's an unfair comparison. Wolves are so much bigger, badder, stronger than little lambs. You know, lambs are meek and mild. They have to be led by a shepherd. Wolves are led by a pack leader, and they're ferocious. You know, they're going to take you down. How in the world is that fair? How, how are they supposed to fight against one, one another? But they're not. <laughs> they're not called to fight because it's not a level playing field. And that's what Jesus wants us to see is that he has not called us to size up the harvest. If we were to size up the harvest with our minds, then we would never go out to reap it and do what he's called us to do. If we, if we try to rationalize the assignments he's given us, then we would talk ourselves out of it. We would say, why would I do that? God, that doesn't make any sense. I don't think I'm going to do that. 
you would never do what God's called you to do because you're trying to understand it. So we just have to accept, I won't ever understand it. And that's okay, because that's how it's supposed to be. Don't let the size of the harvest stop you from laboring. Don't think, wow, the harvest is so plentiful. He says already, the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. How is that fair? It's not. But don't let the size of the harvest discourage you from laboring. Because just as Jesus said in the parable at the last hour, at the 11th hour, who knows, the laborers could come from all over to reap that harvest. God will do what he can and in his own way, in his own timing to reap that harvest. But we just have to be obedient to go out where he sends us. Amen? David said the same thing to Saul. If you remember David and Goliath, Saul actually offered to David his armor. He said, you know, take my armor. It'll protect you. It'll, you know, it'll provide for you. It'll give you some kind of safety. David said, I don't need that. I don't need your armor. And in verse 38 through 40 of 1 Samuel 17, it says, Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head clothed him with a coat of mail, and David strapped his sword over his armor. He tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off, and he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistines. So David said, I don't need that. I don't need what the world has to offer. I don't need what might make sense in the physical. I don't need what might make sense. I just need to do what God's called me to do. And you know what? He's going to provide for me because that's what God does. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Are you with me? (laughs) Number two, remnant isn't the majority. So it's not proportional, and it's not the majority. This next scripture has been real heavy on my heart the last week, and it's kind of, it's kind of a sobering reality when you think about it. Matthew 7, 13 through 14, Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. Those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So remnant is not the majority. And that's a sobering reality, because I'm sure all of you do, but especially myself, I love people. I never like to see people suffer. I never enjoy, you know, when someone's going through a hard time, it's just that, that mercy gift that God has put inside of me. I wanna come alongside them and love them. The thing is though, people have chosen this and it's leading to destruction. And that's, that's so hard for us, to, for us to really wrap our minds around that, that so many people are going to go to hell. And that's just a sobering reality because Jesus says, Narrow is the way, and it's hard, and few will find it. The same passage is in Luke chapter 13. Jesus says, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. But once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and we drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And the people will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and recline at the table at the kingdom of God. And behold, some who are last will be first and some who are first will be last. So not everyone who comes to him at the end is gonna be accepted. And that, that's so hard, that's, I don't enjoy telling you that today. That's the last thing I wanna tell you. I wanna tell you, you know, that, that everyone will be there, but it's not, it's not true. Remnant is not the majority. 
If you can put up this painting, this is a painting, it's called The Bridge by William Ressler. And I apologize that it's actually the highest quality I could find. I would love it to make it totally full screen and, and even crisper. But this painting actually, it's, I don't know how old it is or when it came out, but I remember years ago, for years, someone had gifted it to my dad, I think, and it was in his office hanging above his desk. I just remember looking at it as a child and always just being captivated by it just looking at all the details of what's happening in this painting. And you can see all the arrows that are leading people. And like sheep, they're just following. And where are they going? They're going down. They're going down to the pit of destruction. Wide is that path, and it's leading to destruction. That's the majority. But few are on the narrow path. And it's not from their own accord but it's by the way of the cross that they're able to enter into the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. It's a very beautiful thing when you realize, hallelujah, we're saved, we're on that path, but it's a very sobering reality to friends and family and many that we love that are going to the way of destruction. Yeah. But as remnant, we are called to make a difference. We're called to tell people, hey, you're on the wrong path path. You need to turn around. That's what we're called to do as the remnant. Amen. Right. <clears throat> Society has led us to believe that the majority always knows best. <laughs> that, you know, if there's more people on this side, it must be right. That bigger is better. If you have more likes and more followers and more shares and, and more popularity, then you must be doing something right. We fall into the lie, especially on social media, that if I have something to say of value, then people will want to hear it. And if I get more likes and shares for that, then that, that must mean that my, my self-worth is now going up. It's, it's a deception of the enemy. Because really, what is the majority? The majority is saying the wrong thing. The majority is not in alignment with the word of God. So if we're following the majority, oh, well, those people must know what they're talking about. We'll just go along with whatever that is. No, <laughs> the majority is not following the right path. Majority is on that wide path of destruction. So we need to really search our hearts and as the remnant speak the truth and love to show that the gospel is not the majority. And you know what? God doesn't really care about the opinions of man. God doesn't care if he's got the majority on his side or not. If he said it, he'll do it. He'll perform it. That's the way it is. And that's, that's the end. So it doesn't really matter if the majority is on our side or not. So we have to get away from the sphere of man. We have to get away from, well, I don't want to be looked at funny or treated weirdly. They treated Jesus weirdly. They treated Jesus funny. They hated him. They put him to death on a cross. It's the, the cause of the remnant. All right, I'm going to come back to that, so let me move on. <laughs> so what was number one? Remnant isn't proportional. Remnant isn't majority. Number three, remnant isn't religion. I promise you it's not going to be all gloom and doom. I do have some fun things prepared. <laughs> Stay with me. Remnant isn't religion. Matthew chapter 3. So John is speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees who come to the River Jordan to see the baptisms. And they're kind of snooping around. And, you know, maybe they're there to almost look like they're a part of what's going on, all these people being baptized. <laughs> And John just straight calls them out. He's like, you brood of vipers. <laughs> Why are you here? And I love John. He's just bold and in your face like that. But here's what he says in verse 11 and 12. I baptize you with water for repentance. But who is he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals are not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, if you don't know what chaff is, the wheat 
the stalk of the plant can be separated into the actual grain, which we want to keep for the harvest, and the chaff, which is the part that you don't need. It's useless. It's the part that, yes, you would just throw it into the barn and it will be burned up. So what was Jesus, I mean, what was John here saying about the Pharisees and Sadducees? He's saying the religion that you have been a part of, the traditions, the rituals, they are of no value. They're not redeeming valuable because they're just gonna be burned up in the fire because guess what? You have deserted the part that was worth keeping which was the principles behind those rituals, behind those traditions. And John said, guess what? Your religion will not save you. Coming to church will not save you. In verse nine, he actually tells them, having Abraham as your father, being a descendant of Abraham isn't enough to save you. So it's not, as our world might think, it's not, oh, well, my grandparents go to church, so I think I'll go to heaven. It's not, oh, well, I... I guess that if I go to church once a week, maybe I'll be okay. It's not about religion. It's not about any of that. It's about what? That relationship with God that you have for yourself. Jesus also told the disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Matthew 16, Jesus says, how is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then they understood that he did not tell them to be aware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. If you remember, leaven was something that was used much like yeast is used today in our bread to make the dough rise, right? So it's a very small ingredient that's put into the whole lump of dough. So he's saying, be careful of the little bit of influence that you let into your life because a little will go a long way. A little bit of false teaching here, a little bit of sin here. If you let those things creep in, then pretty soon it's spoiled the whole lump of dough. The Pharisees were known for their hypocrisy because Jesus even called them whitewashed tombs. You say one thing on the outside, but you're one thing on the inside. But the Sadducees, they didn't even believe in the supernatural. So you got the Pharisees over here who are, who are all one end of the spectrum. All, all you need is religion. And then you got the Sadducees over here, which are the other end of the spectrum. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the supernatural. They didn't even believe in life after death. So if they, if they believe there's no consequences to their actions, then you know why would you go to church? Why would you believe in God? So you got two ends of the spectrums here and what Jesus is saying is be careful of the influences that you're letting into your life. And I'm telling you with all seriousness that I can muster in my heart today, be careful of the influences that you are letting into your life because a little will go a long way. A little will go a long way. And both are enemies of the gospel. We know this scripture, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It's very familiar. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. But look at this, what God says, if my people, we can't be responsible for the actions of the world. Like I already said, the world is on the wrong path and we can't be responsible for that. But you know what we can do? We can be responsible for how we will respond to that. If my people, if God's people will repent on their behalf, if we will turn from our wicked ways, God will heal our land and forgive our sin. So we can't control a lack of repentance in the culture, but we can control our own um, pleading on their behalf. And we can see the fruit of that at work now. If you remember a prayer that we've, we've prayed for a long time now, it was actually given at the call maybe 20 years ago and then at the send, it's Jesus, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. God end abortion and send revival to America. And we're beginning to see the fruit of that now in our lifetime. And that's because 
God's people have stood in the gap in the prayer closet who have been watchmen on the wall and we've said, we can't control what culture does, but I can control what I say about it in my prayer closet and I won't stand for this. I repent on behalf of a nation that is not sorry. But the Lord will turn and have favor on a land because the people of God will intercede on their behalf. Amen? Are you in agreement? Amen, because we need that. We need God's favor on our land. There is no other hope for it but God's favor for him to, to, to turn and heal this nation. And it can only happen through the church, through the body of Christ. Number four, remnant isn't half-hearted. So what does that mean, not half-hearted? It means remnant is wholehearted, right? Amen. Your whole heart your whole life dedicated to the Lord. So being half in, half out, being a convenience Christian, being someone who just has a Christian label or a church label, it won't make you remnant. And it won't mean anything on the day of judgment. If you stand before God and you say, but God, I went to church on Sunday mornings at Family First. He's gonna say, sorry, I still don't know you. It won't mean anything. Remnant isn't half-hearted. People of God don't schedule their faithfulness to God based on what the world has permitted them to do. Oh, I'll go to church if I don't have anything else going on. There's nothing else on my schedule. Oh, I'll go to church and I'll, I'll pay my tithe when my bills are paid, when, when I get my um, check in the mail from the government, when I get this, when I get that. Excuses, they're endless. We could come up with them. But remnant who are wholehearted don't have excuses. They're there at church every Sunday morning, even, even when they don't wanna be. You know what, because that's what remnant does. Remnant is obedient to the call of God, even in the face of trial or turmoil or other things that would try to get in their way. Remnant is sold out. There is no other option. There's no turning around. The remnant have sold it all to be missions of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Amen? All right, so I promised that I would not be all gloom and doom. So I have a couple props. And you can see what I have here, some soda. So do I have any Coke fans in the house? All right, all right. Any Diet Coke fans in the house? Okay, like a, a couple. All right, so, sorry, I'm gonna thrash your bubbles a little bit. Um, so, Coke, let me open this. Man, yeah, I hope that was on live stream. Oh, that tastes so good. I'm parched. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Coke, right? That's the, it says Coca-Cola. Now let's see what, what we got over here. It says Coke on it as well, but it's diet version. Yeah, it's just not good. Sorry, just not good. And you know why that is? So both have the same makers, right? They're the same brand. They have many of the same ingredients. But Diet Coke is missing something that makes Coke, Coke. It's missing sugars, which is the delicious part. And <laughs> it's missing the yummy syrups. It's missing, you know, whatever it is that makes Coke so amazing. I'm not a scientist. But you know what they did? Whoever created Diet Coke, they took Coke to the lab. They said, this is such a great drink. How do we make it great, but maybe more plowable? Maybe change the ingredients a little bit? Same packaging, same design, but maybe we're trying to appeal to a different audience. Maybe we're trying to water it down a little bit. And many people will take the Diet Coke when really they're falling for a substitute. 
Diet Coke is not the same as Coke. If you were to taste test these blind, you would know they're not the same. So how come we as Christians are trying to be more like Diet Coke when we really should just be the whole sold out Coca-Cola? I'm Coke and I'm proud of it. <laughs> as I said, why would, why would we try to water down the gospel to make it more appealable, to make it easier to digest, to make it easier for people to want to drink. Maybe it's not as unhealthy, but you know what? If you're going to be unhealthy, drink the whole soda. Drink the, drink the real thing. I mean, who are we fooling? It's not that much healthier. I mean, you're still drinking soda. So come on. How, how much do you want to sacrifice? Because it's not worth it. God has called us to be the wholehearted disciples of Jesus. Amen. He's called us to go all in. You know, that's our little saying around here. All in. That means that one can't be a lesser version of the other. It's the real thing through and through. Amen. John 17, 14 and 15, Jesus says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So Jesus says right there, hey, the world hates me, so they're going to hate you. But I'm not asking that you take them out of the world. I'm asking that you keep them from the evil one because if he were to take us out of the world, then his influence here on the earth would be gone. Like I said, there's no plan B. We are it. We are the solution for this world, the remnant church, the body of Christ. We're it. So we have a mission to fulfill. So he's not going to take us out of this world, but we're going to be protected from the evil one. He's promised us that because we are counter culture. You know, we're not called to be the majority. We're not called to be politically correct. We're not called to be open-minded. We're not called to be tolerant. Any of those other things that culture would say are good. We're the opposite of those because you know what? We stand for something greater, the foundations that are in the word of God that will last forever. Jesus said, my words will never pass away. And that's what we stand upon. Because we don't stand for a kingdom that's of this world. We're not of this world. And you know what? I don't want to be from this world. I look around and I think, thank God that I'm not going to stay here. That I will be caught up with him in the clouds. That this isn't my home. This is just a temporary dwelling place. Amen? Amen. As Dr. Brown always says, he's not an earthian, but he's a Havanian. He's just temporary passing, passing through. <laughs> so it's like we're, we're, an, we're an alien, right? I'm just teasing because Michelle's an alien. <laughs> He's not a citizen. <laughs> All right, so if you'll turn with me to 2, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is a long passage, but I'm going to read it all because it's really good. So just read along with me. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Peoples will be, people will be lovers of self lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Wow. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. For among those are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Isn't that technology? Just to, uh, I'm going to go to verse 10. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra. These persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. 
while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And from the childhood, you have been acquainted with sacred writings who are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I'm sorry. It's just so obvious today, the comparison that we can see between what was spoken in scripture thousands of years ago and what we see every day on the news, what we see right before our eyes. Lovers of pleasure, lovers of self, having the appearance of godliness, denying its power. All of these things swollen with conceit and they're without repentance, without remorse. But what God has called the remnant to do is he said, hey, like Paul, there's gonna be persecutions. He says, every believer in Christ will be persecuted. And if we don't think that's on the horizons for us as United States citizens, then, then we're naive. Because it might come to us, it might come to us in our lifetime and it will probably come to us in, our genera- in the generation after us is lifetime for sure. But you know what? That doesn't mean that we water it down. That doesn't mean that we stop. Persecution persecution may come, but as Paul said, I was rescued out of all of those. At Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, I was rescued from all of those. The Lord didn't take me out of the world, but he kept me from the evil one. And even if he didn't, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, even if the Lord does not rescue us, we will still be willing to be burnt on his behalf because of our testimony. We believe in it that strongly that we're sold out. The remnant is wholehearted. We don't believe one thing and say the other. I believe it so much that I would die for it. And that's what the remnant is called to do, amen? Amen. 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 Isaiah 520, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Any culture can be defined by what they celebrate and what they discipline. This world celebrates evil and it disciplines good. It's taken out prayer in schools. It's taken out all these other things, the godly institution of family. It's taken out and and it's, it's tried to exalt the murder of innocent babies. This culture is so twisted. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but if we take out that fear of the Lord, there is no wisdom, there's just foolishness. So we have, we have to stand true to his word and speak it boldly in faith. Just as you were praying this morning for boldness, we all need more boldness because we have to stand up in the face of all these threats that are against our culture and against the word of God. Because I don't, I don't wanna be counterculture just to be that person. I, I'm not a fighter by nature. I, I don't want to stand up, I hate conflict. But you know what? If something is gonna be in the way of the future of my loved ones, I will be mama bear. Like, don't come at me. <laughs> like, I will take you down, I am a black belt. So, you know, don't get in my way. <laughs> so it's not that we have to be aggressive people but we have to be willing to stand for what we believe in number five remnant isn't earned it's not earned by our good works and we know that from Ephesians chapter 2 for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and it is the gift of God not by works so that no one can boast So being a part of the remnant, going on that narrow path, we can't earn our spot there, but we just have to receive the gift of salvation and he places us there. How beautiful is that? He picks us up from that path of destruction and puts us on that path to the cross. 
Now, in Matthew 25, Jesus is talking about how at the end of the age, he's gonna separate the sheep from the goats. And he talks about when he sees the sheep, he's gonna say, thank you, you know, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. Now enter into my kingdom. And when he looks at the goats, he's gonna say, I was in need and you did not take care of me. And he's gonna say in verse 41, depart from me, you cursed, and into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In verse 46, he says, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And I say that because I want us to realize that good works are not the root of salvation, because we can't earn our salvation, but good works are the fruit of our salvation. Because if you're a Christian, it should not be a surprise to those around you. It should not be a surprise to your friends, to your family. Oh, really? I didn't know that. That shouldn't come out of your friend's mouth, especially if they know you well. It should be obvious to all by the fruit that's around you that you're a believer in Christ. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into my kingdom. Not everyone who says that they're a Christian will be the real thing. That goes back to our Coke and Diet Coke example. Not everyone can be real Coke. But <laughs> I wanna throw up another picture for you. And here's some trees. I'm not really the botanist, but my husband is getting really into agricultural stuff lately, so he taught me this this week. Um, so on the screen you see pictures of two banana trees. So on the outside, if you're not someone who's an expert on plants or like me, I wouldn't have known the difference. They look like they could be the same thing. They're both banana trees. But this one is an ornamental tree, and that one is a fruiting tree. So an ornamental tree is what? It's just used for looks. It says it's prized for their fol foliage, and above all else, their flowers. So they're just kind of decorative to look pretty. But this one, actually, you put it into the ground, it will fruit, and it will produce bananas. So, <laughs> you know, when we're talking about bearing fruit, we could use the same example as we did for the Coke. Which one is the real fruit tree? Because actually the ornamental tree is able to produce fruit, but it won't be fruit that's edible. It won't be fruit that's good for your body. It won't be full of nutrients. It sometimes says, this actually is from an agricultural website. It says, it really depends on the type of tree upon the distinction between edible and good fruit. But often, where is this? The ornamental tree will fruit sometimes as an afterthought. It just kind of does it naturally after a long period of time, but it's not its main purpose. So that's really intriguing to me because what's our purpose? Our purpose is to bear fruit. Our purpose is to be a witness in our culture. So if we're not fulfilling our purpose and we're just, oh, you know, I haven't done anything for God in a while. Maybe I should do this. Maybe I should serve here or just kind of like do it and then I'm good for a couple another months. No, like that's an afterthought through fruit. But we're supposed to bear fruit continually, habitually, fruit that's good and that's edible. That's why Jesus cursed the fig tree. He said, this tree is not doing anything. It's not producing any fruit. I'm gonna curse it, it's gonna die up and shrivel because we are called to produce fruit and fruit that will last, amen? amen? Okay, here's another example for you. This is from a show on Netflix. I'm not really promoting the show, but um, I think it's funny. So this is from It Is Cake, or it, Is It Cake, sorry. And I want you to see if you can spot the real and spot the fakers. Da, da, da. But isn't that amazing? Like, it's so hard to spot the real thing. That's true. And we want it to be obvious to all that we're the real deal, amen? Amen. Okay, so here's my last point, and um, Omar, I'll have you come up and play behind me. Number six, remnant isn't individualistic. So being a part of the remnant and of the body of Christ is like being on a team. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, 
so it is with Christ. So you can rest assured in the fact that the remnant isn't about one person. You know, my context, I grew up playing a lot of sports, so I always think about teams, right? And first of all, that takes pressure off of you when you realize that the body of Christ is like being on a team versus when you play something and you're all alone. <laughs> I've played um, team sports, and then I, I did play tennis for a little while, and I'll tell you what, it was much harder, not really skill-wise, it, it is difficult, but it was much harder mentally to play tennis than it was to play basketball or soccer, because you know what, it, it was just me alone out there. If I made a mistake, there was no one there to back me up. There was no one there to, to catch up. There was no one there. I ruined it. I fumbled and it was over. I lost, I lost the point. But you know, when you're on a team, it takes the pressure off of yourself because if you mess up, it's okay. If you make a mistake, you didn't ruin it. And much like being on a team is the body of Christ because we're all here together in this together as our opening video said the remnant is not about stages it's not about headlines it's not about who's preaching what it's about is about building a body of believers who are strong in their faith it's not about anything else and there's no mvps in this thing other than jesus there's nobody else who's who's to be high and exalted other than jesus there's nobody who's the star player. There's nobody who's, who's worth more, whose salary is worth more than, than Jesus because we're all in this thing together, amen? But when we think about that, we have to realize not everyone's assignment in the body of Christ is equal, but everyone is given equal opportunity to make a difference in their world for Christ. We all have been given that opportunity to do what he's called us to do. We ha all have an assignment. That's something that we preach strongly as our mission at Family First. Embrace people, encounter God, empower leaders because everyone can be a leader. Every one of you, every one of us are called to be leaders wherever God has placed us. So whatever assignment he's given you, he's given you the tools that you need to fulfill that assignment. Don't fall into the lie. Like we said with number one, with being proportional, that I, I, don't, I don't have what I need. No, you might not. But that's how you know when it is fulfilled and it comes to pass that it wasn't you, but that it was God. Because you might not have what you need, but God does. There's nothing that can limit his resources. If we, if we just ask, he'll open the windows of heaven and do what man cannot do. And that's how it's supernatural. So don't discount yourself. You are a vital part of the remnant. And I, I asked Pastor Omar to help me with this. This is a beautiful quilt. Let's step up a little bit. This quilt was actually given to Michelle and I as a wedding present. It was made by my great grandmother and my grandmother had been saving it and gave it to us on our wedding. And um, so it's very sentimental to me. I'm not a quilter, but I know that something like this takes a lot of time and effort. And think about all the remnants of fabric that this took to make. All these pieces, these little bow ties, they call them, had to come together in these little squares and be sewn together in a way that was designed so that they could all serve one purpose together to, to make a beautiful blanket, to, to keep someone warm. So when you think about your role on the remnant, you might just feel like a scrap. You might just feel like a worthless piece of cloth. But you're a vital part of the body of Christ because if any one of these pieces were missing, it wouldn't make this quilt what it is. So every one of you are a vital part of the body of Christ, of the remnant, all of these remnants together make up the remnant that he has called us to be. Amen? Thank you. I'm just going to ask us all to, uh, to 
to uh, stand to our feet this morning. And I just want you to close your eyes. And just pray with me for a second. I just want us to search our hearts. Maybe the Lord has been stirring you all day today that he, that he has prepared you and he is commissioning you to be sent out, to be, to be a bold one, to be someone who, who's not falling into the fear of man, but will preach the truth boldly. Maybe in the midst of a tough situation, he'll give you the strength that you need to overcome it, to speak life into what seems like a terrible situation. Maybe you just need to be re reassured today that you are important. The same God who spoke to the shepherds, who were counted as, as worthless, who were rejected, the same angels that visited them were the same ones that, that spoke to the wise men, the kings, those who had power, those who had money. Amen. The same God reached them both to tell them the good news of Jesus' Jesus birth. That same God wants to reach your heart today. You might not think that you're vital. You might not think that you're important, but he says otherwise. Maybe you just need to be encouraged today to stay true on the straight and narrow, not following the crowds, not following the majority. And that's tough in our culture today. It's tough to go the opposite direction, but he'll give you strength to do it because that's the way that he's called us to go. So if you want prayer this morning, we would love to pray for you. We're just gonna keep the altars open for a couple minutes. I wanna encourage you, we'll be up here. We would love to just love on you and encourage you. But Father God, we just thank you so much for your presence in this place today. We thank you for, for life transformations that are just happening in your body, not because of us, but because of you. We thank you for what you're doing in this hour, that the church is just more alive than it's, than it's ever been. I pray that it would continue to grow. I pray that the remnant would continue to rise up in boldness in the place that you've called us to be. Lord, I pray that, that you would be with each and every one of us as we go from this place, that we are sent out into our different worlds, our different places, the different places where we live, different neighborhoods, different communities, even different towns. As we're sent out from this place, different schools, different workplaces, we're sent out being commissioned with the gospel of Jesus Christ to share your word, to share your truth, to be the same that we are out there as we are in here. Lord, I thank you for your word that's gone forth today, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but with your heart, with your love, and with your, with your power. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.